chap and welcome. This is Mog doing the Egyptian Magic Podcast. And for this episode, I'm going to kind of follow a train of thought that arose in the months of Renotech, which we're still enjoying. And someone showed a rather interesting image of uh, someone known as Senamut. Uh, who is usually described as one of the most eminent and influential personages, persons, people of the 18th dynasty. Uh, So I wanted to talk about that because it's obviously then that Senenmut, who has always been a person of interest to me personally and magically, uh, because of his connection with... uh, Egyptian astronomical uh, monuments, including one of the earliest examples of one of those, which I'll talk about at at some point. And something I didn't know, which I discovered, was that he was some sort of devotee of the goddess Renenotet, which was kind of an important goddess in his hometown of Armont, which is a little bit uh, further um further south i suppose from from luxor or ancient thebes so sen and mut so following that that track someone said well who is sen and mut and i said well he's kind of uh a bit like imhotep in it, <laughs> in some ways that uh in the sense of imhotep imhotep who became which is the name of a kind of minor god uh, within the Egyptian tradition, but actually starts out as a a real person uh, or personage, <laughs> to use the language of the uh, script I was looking at, who is credited with all sorts of uh, ancient technology of medicine, I think, but also specifically the design of the first of the great pyramids, if you will accept that the the pyramid of Djosa at Saqqara would be one of the earliest of the great pyramids, great in the sense of large. Uh, this is the famous step pyramid, and Imhotep was some sort of vizier or civil servant, uh, serving the uh, royal families of uh, of Egypt and uh, King Joseph of the early dynasties. And he was obviously quite a clever person and either commissioned. I mean, this is the moot point which perhaps we would come upon with Sen and Mut, is people are often talked about as being the architect or the designer or the author of a particular text, but... You, you don't really know whether that means that essentially they commissioned it or or organized the whole thing. And and that would be the same with uh, Sen and Mut, who's, a, as I say, uh, also credited as some sort of architect and designer, uh, who one of his many titles, because he seems to have loads of different jobs, was eventually to be in charge of the the building works of the entire Karnak estate, which is absolutely immense and would include all of their farmland as well, from which they uh, derive quite a lot of their income and well-being. So given that he was in control of the uh, the Karnak estate, he'd be the sort of person who, who would maybe either was a very, very gifted scribe and technician in his own right, certainly commissioned um this sort of work uh and we can see as well that if if we if you look on a map of the the whole area you'll see that the great pylon doors of karnak which really are enormous uh, much bigger than you'll find in it almost any other temple as far as i know they're so large that from several miles away, uh, uh, moving directly west, as it were, across the river and into the place known as Gurna, the kind of the holy mountain, the place that contains all the many, many hundreds of 
tombs of the nobles and uh, and also, of course, the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens and all these other kind of things, the mortuary temples and other structures connected with it. And most famously of that is the um, the temple, the mortuary temple of Queen Hatshepsut, which is built into the cliffs of, of the of the holy mountain of the pyramid mountain because it's got this kind of enormous pyramid shape and it it forms this sort of natural uh, amphitheater if you like or view viewing platform perhaps and if you look on the alignment from out of the temple uh which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute minute because that's very connected with sen and wood uh for several miles across to the east you see the great pylons of the karnak temple and and this is obviously deliberate because this these are viewing platforms for viewing th things like the rising of stars but but also the the rising of the sun uh, on the various important quarter days such as the solstices and, and the equinoxes uh, when it on the the solstice when it rises directly between the uh the the kind of doorway of the of the pylon gate and makes this hieroglyphic sign in in a dynamic way of the sun rising between the two mountains which uh, has all sorts of meaning within uh this magical religious culture so this could actually be seen on the horizon so it's kind of almost like a sighting point a sight line so the, there's a connection between the karnak estate and obviously the building projects that take place um on on the the west bank and primarily this uh, enormous temple of uh queen hatshep so which is actually in effect an astronomical or astrological if you, if you prefer observatory uh, and it's designed in such a way and it has all sorts of kind of strange um, sighting instruments uh, built into the actual structure so given that uh, this character Senan Mut was kind of in charge of all that and is usually kind of given as the uh, the architect of the whole thing and uh, and as it has to be pointed out that his tomb which has a, again a, one of these very interesting magical mind games that you so often find and I've described many times within the Egyptian culture uh, that his tomb which is uh, kind of it's usually said to be built underneath the or under the front door of um, of, of Queen Hatshepsut's uh, mortuary temple, so-called, was a temple to kind of worship her departed spirit, more or less. A very, very interesting and strange place. Some people even say that there's a kind of tunnel that goes through the um, the, the temple that leads to the Valley of the Kings, which is not impossible. You know, it's... It, uh, and Senamut's temple, uh, you no know, tomb rather, he has several different tombs. He, he's not of royal birth, but nevertheless, he has several different tombs. Perhaps has his star uh, rose. Um, it, it, then he was able to to build sort of more and more grand um, an, an edifice and reuse his own uh, his previous. Uh, construction for uh, for his parents. I don't think there's anything enough surviving in any of these structures to completely work out what they were all for. He's got several things. He's even got a shrine at Gebel of Sicilla, which is a kind of um, a mining or quarry sort of site uh, a little bit further up, in which you get the famous enormous obelisks for Queen Hatshepsut. So I've mentioned her several times and she's a kind of very, very interesting figure from the 18th dynasty who's often connected with 
uh, Senan Mut, he um, began as a um, from not from a royal family himself, but uh, some there's all sorts of speculations. I mean uh, that he might have come from some maybe from a military family or, or in one way or another, but was able by a process of social mobility uh, to get this this job. He's obviously quite. Unlike a lot of people in Egypt at the time, he was very, very literate and very knowledgeable of the old t text by the sound of it, which I think is underlined by the fact that his first job was actually as as the kind of tutor uh, to the daughter of uh, Queen Hatshepsut and her, and her husband, Thutmosis III. Um, so... Given that he's the tutor, he's appointed as tutor to Princess Neferura, Neferura uh, and becomes the steward of her estate. And he's appointed to that task actually by her father, uh, Thutmosis the second. I, I said Thutmosis the third. Thutmosis the second is actually the the husband of um, Hatshepsut, and Thutmosis the third so this kind of inter interest in a very complicated family structure here is is their son uh, who was destined to become the succeed his father as as the pharaoh but one thing led to another and Thutmosis the second died uh, when, when Thutmosis his son was too young to actually take over and, and so his mother, Hatshepsut, became the um, regent, it's usually said. And in fact, she becomes a regent and eventually she becomes, she takes on the role of the the, the king itself. She becomes a, a female king or a female pharaoh, uh, one of uh, several connected with, in the Egyptian timeline. So I'm very, very interesting for that. And there's all sorts of speculations about um, the relationship between mother and son uh, as he grew up and became impatient to take on his, to take over, if you like, to not have a co-ruler. And in fact, she kind of, uh, her role got bigger and bigger uh, to the sense that he must have been thinking uh, he's never going to get a go. Or, uh, you know, she may have other ideas and everything like that. So there's obviously, in the end, he, he ended up um, really disliking his mother. And she built all these amazing monuments, of course. And as soon as he got the, the power uh, to, 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 to make his own monuments, he, he set about uh, destroying hers or certainly hiding them in some way, which is one of the reasons why the Karnak site is so complicated. So there's that very, very interesting story about Hatshepsut herself and her relationship with her son and with her, with her husband and all the rest. But what we're concentrating on is, is the civil servant known as Senenmut, who was the instrument by which she who put a lot of her plans a lot of the technology of her plans into into operation and whether it's an accident or not there's so many apparently objects dedicated to Senemort's little statues which he obviously had commissioned perhaps because he was in a position to do so uh, I think you probably have more objects named for Senemort than little statues than, than almost anybody else. And whether that's just a, an accident of survival and everybody who is a high civil servant would set about kind of uh, memorializing themselves in, in, in this way. There's also this strange um, issue of the, uh, you have this this temple, right? Which, which has this is a strange, I don't know, contemporary look, I mean, modern look in some ways, 
But I think that's kind of determined by the fact that its function is to do with astronomy, with a religious astronomy and building a an object to focus the the the, the sun in, into the sanctuary at certain times so that it can be observed. An observation of the stars is obviously something that was very, very popular and strong at the time, judging by the other monuments. So we have this um, uh, amazing monument which has many, many rooms within it. It has this like, great open central courtyard, the, the cliff behind it, and this kind of aperture over which the sun can enter into the structure. And you have lots of subsidiary buildings, Some, something like, I think, 50 or 60 different doorways uh, within this structure. And every one of them has a some sort of signature of this civil servant Senamut kind of hidden within it. So it's not overt. It must have been, it couldn't, uh, whether it would have been secret, a secret message that he was uh, encoding in the building that he was commissioning, that's another matter. It's difficult to imagine that such a, a big, one signature maybe, or one sort of code or rebus put into the the structure, but for 60 of the doors to have behind the doors, as the doors open, if you like, behind the leaves, hidden, um, perhaps because he wasn't of royal origin, but it was at this very, very strong connection with the, with the Queen, that his signature, his, his emblem is hidden behind every door, which is quite an egotistical thing, but maybe it's the the details of it this uh, this feature of egyptian culture the need to leave little signs and secrets for the future to find um is something we've explored many many times the other uh example of that is the as I say, the, 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 the final and uh, the most magnificent of the tombs of Senemot himself. So you have this great amphitheater, and then what appears to be a, a, a disused quarry several hundred yards away from the temple itself, you go down there and there's the entrance to Senemot's tomb, which apparently is has been was extended in antiquity and it extends deep into the ground and underneath the mortuary temple so it's almost uh could be a, a secret entrance to the temple itself uh for what purpose it's almost it's 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 saying that he's there he's always connected with the site and with her which has led people to suspect some sort of um, relationship between uh, the two of them, so, which seems most people seem quite dismissive of that idea of a relationship between uh, uh, the aristocracy and a commoner. But uh, who knows? You know, what one way or another. Certainly, this this is not just a modern speculation. People in the ancient world themselves obviously speculated on. Uh, this possibility and there's this rather scurrilous it's quite a lot of graffiti as well connected with uh sen and mut and with um hatshepsut usually kind of again with these sort of double meanings you know so you have an image of sen and mut and it might be shown with what could be a rat so you could be saying is he a rat uh, or is he a mouse it could be a mouse is he a which destroys the harvest or is it a fox which is a kind of more cunning creature these double entendres really some of them are very very double entendres there are kind of some quite scurrilous bits of graffiti from the other world which shows sen and mut um or what can you say having sex with uh hatshep sort in a quite a baldy erotic manner so this was obviously the speculation that their relationship was so close or may have been so close that um, 
they were actually having this illicit uh, affair ac across the tracks, as it were. Whether I say what complicates all this is the fact that um, the son I mentioned, Tutmosis the Third, who eventually did get his his uh, moment of fame and uh, control and all the rest uh, and set about blackening the memory of his mother one of the things that he may have sort of set in motion or, or, or allowed to happen were all these scurrilous rumors about her kind of illicit relationships with 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 her civil servants and her mother People write whole speculations and books about the whole thing. The fact that they both seem to disappear from, according to some views, some people say, well, they didn't disappear, they're there. But they, Senamut definitely seems to fall from grace. It may be that, given that he entered into the service of uh, Hatshepsut at, um, I don't know, when he was, he certainly would have been old enough to act as a tutor to a, to a child. So then perhaps by the time he fell from, disappears from the record, he could be anything from 50 to 70 years old. I don't know how, it's difficult to say whether it's, maybe he's a bit the same, it could be the same age as, as Hatshepsut if he's acting as a, a, tutor to her to her daughter it's quite possible then that there's a kind of overlap in ages or the sim similarity of ages so it or it could be that he he was older than her and that his fall from uh public visibility in the ancient world was just purely down to ill health or uh, age you know if he really was 50 or 70 that's quite a good age although people often live longer and both of them seem to fall from grace maybe the fact that she eventually kind of uh disappears from the picture there's even speculation that they're kind of connected with the story of moses and the exodus and all the rest and that there's even a theory that senamut is or a mad speculation if you like that senamut is actually uh, a kind of version of moses uh He's, he's the figure in which Moses is based on. Actually, the the, the pharaoh's name is Tutmosis, and uh, Tutmosis the second and third. That that is the name Moses as well. So I don't think I need to go there. But it is these all sorts of things are very very interesting. I'm just um, more interested in uh, the astrological and astronomical monuments of Senemut. So, but it is good to know something about his his story, how he kind of became tutor and then took on more and more roles and and and, and uh, responsibilities and power really, building this incredible uh, astronomical monument, which is the the uh, temple of Jeser Jeseru of. Queen Hatshepsut, which is, I was lucky enough to go there on a special day uh, at dawn to watch the watch the dawn at, at this temple. Uh, I'll show you some shots of that. When this rather strange thing, I think it was about February the second that I was there, which within our kind of ritual calendar uh, is in bulk or candle mass it's a, it's a cross quarter day uh within the european kind of occult witchy tradition of the, of the ritual year you wouldn't really expect that to have any relevance within uh egyptian culture but strangely enough it does uh, so i'll tell you a little bit about that uh my experiences of trying to film that and what it, it might actually mean. Okay, so to round that off a bit, and sorry if I repeat myself a little bit, I've 
recorded this in stages, I mean, trying to kind of pioneer some new equipment, which didn't always go completely according to plan. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I wanted to talk about the what's known as the archaeological curiosity that Senema, this character we've been talking about, was the owner of two two tombs, two decorated tombs, quite near to each other in the great necropolis of Western Thebes. This is tombs TT, TT standing for Theban tomb, 71 and tomb 353. So tomb 71 is located on the upper slopes of uh, Sheikh Abu El Gurna, which is a hill. You've got a great big uh, pyramid mountain hill, Gurna, and sort of lesser foothills, I suppose, or they can be quite steep as well. And one of these is called uh, Sheikh Abu Al Gurna. And I uh, should say, I originally encountered this because it, it, I was interested that it had the remains of a, a Sufi or Muslim shrine of a holy man buried up on the on the mountain there, which is quite well preserved. Uh, in fact, it's rather unusual. It's had a, a roof put on it, uh, which I'm told is not normal for these kind of uh, cities, these, these shrines. Perhaps I would say given its location, you might expect it's, it's actually, as so many, it's part of a, a pharaonic tomb as well, but it's supposed to be from the Sufi or Muslim period. So I wanted to go and visit this. Was, uh, I, uh, maybe I'll share a few pictures of that. It's a very interesting experience in its own right. Uh, it w it's quite an isolated place now. There was a whole village built up there, uh, which was cleared by order of the Egyptian government in sort of a, a behest of archaeologist I suppose who wanted to kind of uh, create a kind of archaeological theme park up there but um, whatever I was able to we, accompanied by one of the original people who lived there in this Arab village that had been there for quite a long time uh, took, took me up to there and to get there you have to go through the the uh, Theban tomb areas and in the last part you, you climb up this rather magnificent tomb which looks a little bit like a kind of Greek Greco style thing with pillars and everything but it is actually Egyptian uh, and you walk up in, through the center and to get to this shrine as it happens that that tomb decorated tomb which is uh, in a little bit of a ruinous state, as part of it has collapsed, uh, it was a decorated tomb. It must have been quite magnificent in its day for a, a tomb, not of a member of the royal family, but of uh, a noble. Uh, has the kind of, uh, as I mentioned, uh, an awful lot of, uh, for a civil servant, sentiment le left a lot of different uh, statues and, of him, and images of himself and all scattered all over the place and there's another one of them there with him sitting with uh, Neferu Ra who was the young princess daughter of Queen Hatshepsut and Tutmosis II and his the beginning of his career was as was to act as tutor and guardian of the, the princess so tells you he, he must have been quite respected as a someone who could do that who come from a lowly background but and this he his success is built upon that so you might assume he has a certain amount of knowledge so that's the first tomb but as it happens there's another tomb uh tomb 353 which he built later in his career in a a hillside location it's a, a, a in a Whereas the first tomb is on the hill, this one is more in a quarry. It's much lower down, but it's much closer to the famous temple of uh, uh, mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, which itself is a kind of astronomical observatory, as it happens. Uh, 
And uh, I've got a story of, about my encounters there as well, which is kind of rather interesting. So the tomb has very, very different to the first tomb. It's quite a plain concealed entrance that leads, has a tunnel that leads about 100, at least 100 metres underground in effect sneaking its way through the hillside until it ends up actually virtually inside or certainly underneath the magnificent mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, uh, the Jessa Jessaru. Uh, and it's usually thought that that's a deliberate act of association with, uh, with the queen. And there's this kind of quite intense relationship between all the different uh, elements and people in this whole story uh, including speculations about a, a, a relationship between Hatshepsut and Senenmut. Uh, these are not modern speculations or there's plenty of those as well. There are ancient speculations about the possibility of a relationship between them and given the number of monuments and this very interesting fact that his signature appears on so many of her monuments as well so there's this rather amazing tomb uh which i'll talk about in a little bit i wanted to like most people visiting uh this area in luxor i, I went to the uh, tomb of uh, uh, sorry the temple or mortuary temple of hatship so many many times and one of the first times i went there i uh, they're renovating this very complicated tomb and uh, I, I kind of so the archaeological team uh, was there and I managed to talk to some of them at, and one time I was there I kind of encountered the Polish uh, conservation team who were working on rebuilding bits of the temple and opening the solar complex I think it is and I was talking to the guy and actually rather naively I asked him if there was any chance of seeing the tomb of uh, Senunut, which is kind of not really possible. But anyway, he was, he was very forthcoming and he told me that that morning in the temple something really unusual had happened at dawn, uh, that someone who was arriving had noticed that there was... A kind of astrological event, I suppose you'd say, given that the the temple from the pictures you can see that is a kind of as well as its religious and mortuary uh function has this function as a, which is related of course as a astronomical observatory so basically what happened is the if you if you look at some of the pictures there's this kind of alignment to the eastern sunrise uh, from the temple across the plain to, to Karnak. Uh, and there's a kind of aperture, if you like, an instrument in, in, in the cliff above that allows a beam of light to pass in, into the, the Holy of Holies of the temple and illuminate the shrine there of the god Amun. Uh, and it does this on the summer solstice because I was there on February the 2nd, which is nowhere near the solstice or the equinox. Uh, and But the, the same thing had happened. And as it turns out, anyway, I returned the next morning, got up at dawn and made my way across the necropolis trying to avoid all the sort of feral dogs there was rather wonderful but kind of slightly intimidating uh and i made my way there and i was able to be there at dawn which wasn't too bad it was about eight o'clock i think and sure enough this beam of light or this pool of kind of molten sunlight appears in the in the holy of holies quite clearly and what you've got there, you've got a kind of rectangular room with a statue of Amun right in the centre point. But either side of it would have been, in the four corners of the room, would have been four statues of Hatshepsut 
in the form of the god Osiris. And as it happens, so there would be two two statues, one each side of the Amun uh, statue. Uh, and as it happens, the beam of light lit up these statues of Hatshepsut, not Amun, but the, the two side well the one on the one side presumably at, at the corresponding time of year across quarter day later on in the year it, it would illuminate the other statue uh so it's kind of like a, a a clock uh a solar a sundial clock but uh in which which has this sort of symbolic form and i'll uh, i can show you the sequence of pictures of this kind of molten uh square of light passing over the statue of Hatshepsut and then it appears to kind of pass out of the temple so it's almost like it's brought her to life it's flowed through her body uh, from the top to the bottom and then it, it's kind of progressed out of the door of the temple and uh, I saw that and uh, lots of people it, it's obviously the intention uh, with this kind of instrument so that was the Temple of Hatshepsut, which is this rather amazing structure connected and designed presumably by Senenmut that has this astronomical uh, feature to it as an, as an observatory and there are probably other observations that it's able to make uh, during the course of the year. And as it happens, his tomb... Uh, which is, as it, it's not exactly underneath, but it's sort of connected. It, it sort of touches base, if you like. Uh, in, in fact, it could be well underneath this whole process because the, you go in through this uh, very simple doorway and you pass for, according to the reports, for uh, about 100 um, metres under tunnel that passes in the direction of, of the main mortuary temple of Hatshepsut. So, and then, so that would make the sarcophagus chamber of this ancient temple directly underneath uh, Hatshepsut. So this is kind of direct connection between the two figures, which is very, very interesting. And as it happens, it within the, the temple of uh, the tomb rather of Sen and Mut is the oldest of what's known as an astronomical ceiling which is the ceiling of a crypt or if it's not an actual crypt meaning a cave-like structure then it, if it's in another building as it happens in some of the nearby other temples the, the the room is made to appear as if it's underground like the crypt so that's obviously quite an important part of the symbolism which we kind of uh, refer to many many times in terms of the uh, the mechanism of this uh, magical transformation chamber uh, this crypt like nature of it uh, but on this one is this rather amazing and in fact the earliest example found and presumably could even be the earliest example of this rather complicated astronomical ceiling uh, which shows uh, the constellations of the northern sky which are p particularly important for uh, the Egyptian worldview as being the kind of destination of the soul after rebirth but of, for the process of regeneration as well also the, the these northern constellations have, you could group them and say there are seven of them and they alternate on a, there's a, a, a path of the pole star that tracks its way through these seven constellations on a long cycle of about 25,000 years, uh, a cycle that was known about uh, to the ancient Egyptians quite obviously. Uh, you can work that out from the even this this elaborate glyph of Sen and Muk that... Uh, they knew all sorts of things like this. You also have in it rather magnificent the 12 circles representing the 12 um, lunar months, if you like. So it's a, it's a lunar calendar, which again is 
uh, one of these interesting phenomena. Now we're talking about the uh, the eighteenth dynasty, not later astronomy. This is quite old. This is about fourteen hundred BCE, uh, and it's the very earliest. It's not the earliest example of an astronomical monument, but it's earliest example of an astronomical ceiling that we know, and it's the model for lots of later ones. Certainly in the in the area, the one of the, in the Ramesium and the one in the uh, mortuary temple of Ramesses the third and uh, lots of others. It gives rise to a whole sequence of uh, what you would call the 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 decans as well. The the, the decans are laid out within this um, monument. Uh, all of these kind of features of uh, of Egyptian way of looking at things quite complicated and you need a little bit of guidance. I've just given you the the kind of heads up on it really, but you need a bit more detailed information to kind of make use of this. But it's obviously that these are the mysteries that the adept, the person who is because these are things for the for the living and the dead, as the texts always point out. So uh the decans also, the constellation uh, Orion, which uh, uh, is incredibly important, not a northern constellation, a, a southern constellation, but in incredibly important in this form of symbolism. The star Sirius and the five planets known to the ancients. So you have the kind of entire uh, set of uh, astronomical monuments and, and details that were thought important to know about within the Egyptian um, magical religion and the thing that we make good use of as well. So all in all, a, a fantastic tomb and it leaves us with this elaborate um, diagram which I'll reproduce in various uh, perspectives for you with a lunar calendar and lots of other details as well. It's like like an entire grimoire, really, one way or another. So that's Senan Mut. Uh, he he never actually he or his spirit or whatever n never actually made it into the into any of his tombs, uh, which is another one of these mysteries that's often speculated about about what happened to it. sometimes to Hatshep. So. Uh, perhaps less so, but what happened to Sen and Mood? What happened to his wife? No, for someone who had so many of these amazing uh, statues and monuments, why was as very little being found from his actual funeral, leading people to think maybe he um, didn't remain in Egypt? He he went somewhere else. Who knows? It's like a must part of the myth of the. Magician, in a way, is that they have this kind of empty tomb, uh, which they use in the while well, living to reconstruct and to to um, resurrect in in many ways. But it's always like the tomb of Christian Rosencrantz, you know. It's it's reconstructed, which is based on this sort of stuff, of course. Uh, but you might not. He was actually found it the legend in still alive in the, in the tomb but that's uh, another matter okay so that that's Senemut, uh, a person that is well worth investigating and whose ideas and uh, writings and uh, theories we still make good use of and gives rise to the Senemut group of decans it which is reproducing several other later uh, monuments uh, and papyri. Um, so that's what I wanted to share with you today about Sen and Mut. Um, other news before I finish? Uh, well, I've heard that we are uh, putting together a an event, the re rebirth of the uh, International Symposium of Thelemic Magic, which includes, of course, a great deal of magical uh, stuff from Egypt. Ultimately, uh, the Thelemic system, of uh, which is channeled or whatever, 
by Alistair Crowley is uh, is is primarily an Egyptian system, or certainly a combination of Egyptian, East West Egyptian and uh, Tantric system, one way or another. So that's in uh, September, later in the year, and uh, that's a live event. There may be some stream elements to it, and some quite a lot of it is going to be filmed and uh, other podcasters such as uh, Angela Puka is filming hers and will use her contribution on her own podcast. Uh, so Oxford's a very nice place to visit, so why not uh, come along? There's a, a website at uh, the Visible College called thelemicsymposium.co.uk UK, which you can get details of the early bird tickets and all the rest and uh, other things that we'll be doing there. So that would be great if you like the podcast. Of course, please do subscribe and ask your friends to subscribe as that uh, enables this thing to grow uh, and more information, and which is coming up all the time from the research into this magical system to be added to the collection of films that are now in this uh, growing archive of uh, Egyptian magic podcast. So thank you for listening and uh, send up tea.